Welcome back to the land of Sumer. In the first video, we saw that the first city, Uruk, is ideally divided into three equal units, orchard, clay pit, and city, plus the temple. Does this correspond to something in reality? In this video, I will tell you about the city itself. What exactly do we know about it? What does recent research tell us about it? What are the main buildings and features? An idea. Before you watch this video, what about taking a pen and draw up a list of the main features of a city in general? What defines a city from your point of view? You can then compare it to with the Sumerian city. In this video, we will mainly focus on the city of Ur, which is the best known because it has been excavated in quite some extent compared to the other megacities. So let's go on our turn to Ur. So here is the city of Ur at the end of the 3rd millennium BC. We saw in the first video that temples and walls were essential features in the Sumerian cities, and indeed they are. The temple occupies a, a huge space in, within this city, as you can see. It is essential because it is literally the house of the god. It is believed that the god, or the goddess, was living in the city, and they protect the inhabitants from everything. No need to say that the city simply cannot exist without the house of its god. The walls, in the same way, also protect the city, both against floods, which can be extremely dangerous, and the enemies. But what else do we find in there? In the war, we have two harbors. Cities are trade centers, where you can exchange products, and especially where you can find some exotic materials and common products. Cities can be defined as exchange, as exchange centers. We also have the palace. The figure of the king becomes more and more prominent during the third millennium BC, and he needs a place where to live, so this is it. Literally, he lives, the big man li lives in the big house. So this is, uh, however, during this period, the palace still does not occupy the place it will take in later, in later period. As you can see, the one in Ur is rather small, but Ur may be an exception here. There are bigger palaces elsewhere, in Eridu, for instance, where it looks as if there was a political center clearly distinguished from the religious one, and we have similar situations in other cities. What else in the city? Of course, the small houses, the ones for you and me. We will take a closer look at them in a second. And the last remarkable feature is empty spaces. Basically, when you look at the plan of this city, you, it looks almostly empty. We will focus on those at the end of this video to see how we can fill the gaps. But first, let's have a look at those houses, one of the residential district, this one, actually. Well, it looks like a maze. Streets are narrow, houses are packed. It looks as if there was no plan, no organization there. As if people just arrived, stopped and built the house without thinking much further. For a long, long time, this is what we thought about Sumerian cities. Organic growth, no planning. But if you take a closer look at it, both on the plan and the photos taken by the archeologists, you will see that streets are straight and some are quite large. They divide larger plots that may be the original organization of this district. Are the Sumerian residential districts better planned than we first thought? It is probable, and current research seems to confirm this. What is sure from this picture is that this city is densely populated and probably very crowded, even though it remains difficult, almost impossible, to estimate the number of people living there. Let's have a closer look at one of those houses. First, do you see where it is? Well, it's here. So, this one is often presented as a model for this ideal Sumerian house. One of the reasons is that it is organized around a courtyard that gives access to the whole house. This is uh, this uh, rectangular room here, if we go on with our visit, is usually understood as the reception room. Behind it, we have a chapel over there, maybe for the, uh, Sumer, uh, the funerary cult. There were tombs under the floors of the houses where some ancestors of the family were buried. Here, we probably have a kitchen. There was an oven. The small room over there uh, was understood uh, by the archaeologists as toilets or bathroom, but this is much uncertain. In this room here, we have a staircase. This is more problematic. Does this mean there was a second story? The archaeologists thought so and suggested, and suggested this reconstitution. 
Now, this is much under debate, and most archaeologists believe the stairs were giving access only to the terrace, essential an essential living space in warm and dry countries, to sleep, for instance, if you are wondering where the bedroom would be. Maybe the second story did not cover the whole, the whole first floor, like in this example, which was drawn after a terracotta model of a house. It is a lovely little house for sure, but a model? It appears that many houses are not organized around the courtyard, for instance, here. Uh, same goes for the kitchen. It is not systematic. Most houses are too small to have an extra room to cook. On the other hand, many houses are staircases. Anyhow, it gives you an idea of the Sumerians of Sumerian life conditions in those crowded di districts. Let's turn now to one of the most intriguing features, the empty spaces. As you can see, empty spaces occupy huge surfaces in those cities. Obviously, we do not know well the organization as a whole. First thing to keep in mind is that there probably were empty spaces in Mesopotamian cities, like huge squares for assembly meeting. Those empty spaces especially underlined the limits of archaeological research until recently. How would it be humanly possible to excavate such huge sites completely? Now, what can, you hope to, what can we hope to find in those empty spaces? Well, for instance, structure or places made of perishable materials, which means they don't last, like orchards or markets. Markets are not like our supermarkets. Shops can be small tents to dismantle at the end of the day. We don't know much about them, but sometimes we have unexpected information. For instance, a map of the city of Nippur tell, tells us there was a big garden in the city just there. But this document dates from mid-second mid millennium BC, that is few hundred years after the Sumerian period. But we can also have structure that do leave some traces, such as craft or industrial areas and rubbish pits. And of course, there must be more houses in there. And this is where new methods and recent research tell us a lot more about them. Recent research allows us to complete the mapping of those huge sites. More attention is given now to the empty spaces and city edges within the walls. To find out about them, archaeologists use satellite and drone imagery, magnetic radiometry and large-scale surveys, that is collecting pottery shards and artifacts on the surface layers. Surveys are not new, but they are now more systematic and are better understood with the complement of aerial imagery. We know a lot more about the city of Lagash, for instance, thanks to an ongoing joint expedition of the universities of Cambridge and Pennsylvania. Here is what we knew about Lagash from the archaeological point of view so far, not much. But new excavation in 2019 focused on the city edges. A craft zone was excavated. Several pottery cranes were unearthed. The area clearly shows an intensive production over a long period of time. The team also undertook a, lar a large mag mag magnetomagnetometric mapping, which revealed a densely occupied city in some areas. In the north, imagery shows, shows a few straight streets that run at right angles, very much like a grid plan. In the south, houses are less regularly disposed, but there is a main street that is about 10 meters wide. It is quite different from the organic growth that we thought characterized Sumerian cities for a long time, and we can see that planned urbanism maybe was more common than we first thought. This is all research in progress. For the time being, it raises more questions than solves problems, but it certainly opens exciting new horizons about Sumerian cities. Here is the city of Ur, as we know it from the excavations. We can only try to imagine what it could have been, probably a dynamic city, a wonderful hub for trade that would have attracted thousands of people. But there is one chance that one day our vision will be more detailed and leave spa less space to imagination. We still have so much to learn about those cities to better understand them, and this is why archaeological research is so exciting. Now that you have more information about the origins of Sumerian cities and their main features, you're welcome to watch the following two videos that will tell you more about living conditions in those first megacities. Thank you again for your attention.